Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. We've got plenty <laughs> okay. of people ready for this. So good afternoon and welcome to Copperfields Books virtual event with Diane Johnson in conversation with Kara Black. My name's Jamie Madsen. I'm the marketing and events coordinator here and will also be your host for the evening. So for 40 years, well, I guess it's the afternoon, excuse me. <laughs> for 40 years, Copperfields Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together. And just a couple of housekeeping items to note today, we will be using the chat box to provide links for upcoming events, details for purchasing Diane and some of Kara's title, as well as discount codes. And I'll also include my contact details. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the speakers. The format will feature between 30 to 40 minutes of speaking and will then be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please go ahead and submit your questions and comments here rather than replying to me in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce today's author, Diane Johnson. Diane is a best-selling author and two-time finalist for the National Book Award who lives in Paris and San Francisco. And in conversation with Diane today is Kara Black. Kara is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of 19 books in the private investigator Amy LeDuc series, which is set in Paris. She lives in San Francisco with her husband and son and visits Paris frequently. They are with us to discuss Dan Diane's latest title, Lorna Mott Comes Home. And we're at a different time today because Diane is with us from Paris, which I'm so pleased about. And I'm thrilled to hand it over to you, Kara. Why don't you take us away? Thank you, Jamie. And Diane, uh, bonsoir. <laughs> bonsoir, Kara. Oh, wait, you've gone mute. Have I gone mute? Can you hear me no, now? Now you're back, yeah. Sorry, I don't know why that happened. Um, yeah, so it's wonderful to see you. I'm thrilled to do this. And as we briefly, you know, I last saw you in Paris. How great is that to say? Okay. I love saying that. Yeah. But we we were in, it was in Mont Rouge at a, at a, at a atelier. It was a music performance. I forget I why we were there. It was something, yes. Yeah, and it was just so fantastic to meet you then. And um, also, I have met you in San Francisco before when you used to yeah. be here a, a lot more often. But we have the same arc or, you know, pattern. Yeah, only I haven't been to Paris for this whole period of COVID and have you have you been there the whole time? I've been here the whole time I was stranded here. So I at least you know I had the, probably the better time. Um, yeah I yeah yeah but totally confined as well, confined so right right is how is it is it how is it now in Paris? Can you give us a it's quick open snapshot? Now. Every almost everything is open. Um I'm I'm not sure but what the virus isn't spiking again we were waiting you know they're supposed to announce the results of uh, last week's you know cases and so on um, yeah and i think they may very well and we're still wearing masks in indoor uh, situations I so see. they're expected to think about whether or not people have to put back masks back on, on the street. Oh, wow, yeah. So, yeah. What, you know, I, I just wanna say, I love Lorna Mont Comes Home and just loved it and just really relished so much. There's so much to talk about. There's so many themes, but um, just wanna say, I never expected this, but I had a dream about Donna, the character last night. <laughs> And I was like, why? And she wasn't my favorite or the most likable character, but I dreamt about her. So there was something about her that really got under the skin, you know, about who she was, which was true of all your characters in this incredible story. But of all people, Donna. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. But I guess yeah. maybe Donna's concerns are universal real estate. Real estate. Or yeah. Good. Yeah. Totally, totally. Absolutely. She's yeah. with her, her twin sons in the right preschool and all that. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm eager, I'm eager to talk about all these themes. But um, 
before we do that, do you think you want to just give us, tell everyone who maybe doesn't know about your life, how you ended up in France or, you know, you're kind of by coast, I mean, by, what do you call it, uh, yeah. into an expat life? Yeah. Con yeah, um, by continental, yeah. yeah. Yes, everyone assumes because I have written about France that I had some dream of going to France, but that was not the case. It was my husband who was doing some, he was a professor at UCSF uh, doing research and he was working on research with a French fellow who was in San Francisco. They hadn't quite finished and so we, we took a sabbatical so he could finish his medical research. And of course, easily followed from there. We fell in love with France and bought a little apartment and, you know, then a little bigger one and <laughs> slippery slope. So Slippery slope, yeah. And your yeah. children are basically, uh, your children are grown, but do they live there and do you have French one grandchildren? One of them does live here. One of them, yes. Uh, one is married to a French husband and they have three, uh, boys of kind of in the early 20s so um so i have a french family which legitimates me in in the french context right 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 let's talk about this i mean so many of your novels i mean of course there's the divorce and the mariage and um uh, you know deal with the expat life you know in france you know especially specific many americans um and there's so many complexities to that. You know, it's, um, I really love, you have a quote, it's on page 13, which I totally underlined because I have heard all my friends who live in France say it, I can never ever get the cheeses right. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of I like- I've never gotten the cheeses right, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that just seems so encapsulate so much of, of you know, life in France as an expat, you know. Um, and, and I can tell you that French people, um, I'm, the, uh, my example is my grandsons, boys in their 20s, hardly concerned with cheese, but they know the cheese and they know the order in which to eat it and where it comes from in the regions of France. I don't know how this is done, but um, something about French culture is pervaded very effectively by French education and stuff. Education and food and yeah, yeah. I, that's that's totally amazing. Um, yeah, and then didn't de Gaulle say it's how can anyone expect to govern a country with sorry, 365 cheeses or whatever or something <laughs> like that or yeah. we made more of it. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> um, and you and you know this book. I mean, there's there's beauty and there's shadows, um, but there is such a uh, you know a, a, a also a funny. You're funny, okay, Diane. You are very witty, and you know you have this laser wit. So I don't want people to think you know it's pathos, even though we start off the story with in the in the cemetery <laughs> in a graveyard. In a graveyard, yes, it's just yeah. sliding down, which is kind of this comedy of manners or whatever that happens. But yeah, why don't you, why don't you, of course, if we haven't read the book yet, you know, kind of bring us into the story. This is a big life change for Lorna and we have this whole graveyard slipping down. Can you bring us into the story, kind of sure. set it up? Um, yeah, Lorna is a woman of a certain age. Um, she has grown children, so that will help. And she has been married for 20 or 20 odd years to a French husband, Armand Lou a museum curator and a uh, woman chaser. And finally she's had it. She just has had enough and she's homesick for America. And so she decides to, that they should separate at least. And she would go back to America and they would spend some time apart. She, she's not resolved on divorce exactly, but she thinks it's, that's probably where it'll go. So she, the graveyard event, uh, happens just as she's leaving and actually doesn't play a huge role except as a, a scene to start the book. Um, she, so she flies back to America, to San Francisco and much of the book takes place in San Francisco. I won't tell you where she ends up. Yeah. Um, no, no. 
But she has to decide between America and France, between her husband and no husband. Uh, she tries to get her career back. She's an art historian who gave sort of edifying lectures. And she finds that the market or demand for lectures is not quite as <laughs> as it used to be <laughs> yeah. before Zoom and before uh, the internet generally. It, this takes place in 2008, just at the time of the crash. Obama is president, newly president. I, I felt I could not deal with the Trump era. That, that would be just too, too much to heap onto this book. And so that, you know, so I took it back to 2008. Yeah, I think that really works. And also, you know, the, the graveyard, I mean, sort of in the end is the beginning kind of the, there is a, um, a metaphor, I thought, um, I don't want to read too much into it, but I felt there was a metaphor, you know, that it's the graveyard is sliding. I mean, the skeletons are sticking out and, you know, the past is recurring, right? The past that won't yeah. go away. Yeah. And so what Lorna yeah. faces in San Francisco, you know, could be turned sort of yeah. her graveyard. Yeah, <laughs> I did like the, the met metaphorical significance of, of people emerging from their graves. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We yeah, yeah. yeah. And then this one uh, American who uh, was an artist there, kind of an unknown, not known during, I guess, famous in his lifetime, who has become very uh, prestigious now, is, is comes up. And Lauren is all involved in the paperwork of all that business, which I thought was very skillfully handled at the end of the story. But we can't, <laughs> we can't talk about that. Um, <laughs> I thought also the theme uh, so many themes, but especially family. What is a family? You know, how, what does it mean to be a family? You know, who is family? You know, um, I thought it was very broadly explored here. You know, all these different people related by blood or by marriage um, or by, yeah, by marriage. Yeah. Um, by in marriage. Yeah. How, how did all that come about? Because they're pretty diverse uh, section of people. Well, I think um, I, part of it came came out from my my family. Um, John is w was my second husband. Um, I was his second wife, so that already adds a layer of relatives. And then I have four children. John had three, um, and they all have spouses. And so, before you know it, you have a very large cast of characters. Of course, I don't didn't directly use my children, but I did use some of their qualities or characteristics. So, um, one of my daughters does actually make uh, leather dog collars that she sells, or she used to, and and so on. You know, I borrowed their some of their habits. So that part was taken from life, I guess. Wow, wow, yeah. And then she, well, we can't talk about what happens with her. But yeah, it's it's also, and also the, the there's a theme of entitlement, you know, characters who are entitled, who feel, you know, who feel, who expect certain monetary, you know, uh, money, you know, um, or to be included, a privilege, you know, I mean, these are privileged characters, even though they may be, you know, have a house foreclosing or, or whatever, it's an interesting, um, yeah, well, I was worried about that actually, that this would be a subject of, of criticism and, you know, irritation or political incorrectness or something. Again, it's sort of, a, it's very Bay Area. Very um, Bay Area. Yeah. And so I, not, nothing is exaggerated, but one of the characters is married to a, a dot com millionaire, Russ, uh, who's actually a character from an earlier book. Le Mariage. Ah, uh, okay. Amy Hawkins. And yes, Amy. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So one of Lorna, Lorna's first husband is married Amy Hawkins, and that puts them into a, a privileged or rich league. They live in Woodside yeah. and so on. Um, oh, but I think you got that spot on, Diane, because I live in San Francisco, and you know, I mean, everyone on our street, you know, are are those kind of people. Um, yeah. I grew up, 
I grew up in Woodside, but the poor part of Woodside, not, not the other side where the horses are. We always used to say just at the beginning. And the Woodside, Woodside I grew up in is totally different from, you know, the people. It was always a very wealthy neighborhood with the horse side, but yeah, but yeah it's very different now. It's full of Teslas and, you know, um, it, I think you got that spot on. I mean, that's so very Bay Area. Yeah. I hope so. Uh, it was fun to write about the Bay Area and and it's um, these nuances of sociology that probably aren't that known. Yeah, no, I think you and then also that that whole thing of Morna is coming to San Francisco. Uh, the San Francisco she lived in lived right was twenty years ago and and how it's changed. And I thought that was so spot on to how how Morna sees it you know and it's also the theme of of like that Thomas Wolfe book you can't go home again can't yeah, you go home again games, yeah and oh, it and, won't be the same anyway if you do right yeah. and she and she and she and then there's also another line and I wrote it down because I just thought it was so lovely um where Morna on page 131 when she's going to her first party she's trying to get back into the social scene and you know make contacts in San Francisco when re-entering society after a long long absence you come in by the same door you left uh, both in I have my glasses here both in in the host's eyes and in your in your eyes as well so you're kind of if you were 14 years old you're still 14 years old or I just thought that was brilliant, you know. Um, that's and such true, a true thing. Yeah, yeah. Truism, truism. Yeah. yeah, I mean, do you ever feel that when you when you go back to see people in San Francisco when you visit? Do you? Well, do you I feel I come back often enough that you, you know, I'm not experiencing any kind of um, surprises. Uh, it, it, I kind of track it as it track goes. Track it, along. yeah, yeah. But Morna here, she's of a certain age, or maybe even a little older than of a certain age. Yeah. Um, she's really, is she reinventing herself? Is she turning the page, starting a new chapter? And how, I think, how many readers, how all of us can relate to trying something new, you know, turning the page. Yeah, she wants yeah. to turn the page. Uh, she's full of enthusiasm. She's interested in her, her um, her work, you know, she has her work. She, she, she's interested in the tapestries of Angers and she's worked up some lectures about that. Um, um, yeah, uh, she's, yeah, she comes back full of optimism. Um, of course, there are some unwelcome surprises related to her age and to uh, the demand for lectures. And, um, the price of rent in San Francisco and, you know, lots of nonstop unpleasant surprises. Yes. She drank at one point and it's $600 for them to put a bandage on it. Uh, so true. Yeah. Yes. yes, so true. And she's also, um, you know, and about her, you know, as a woman, you know, uh, did she, you know, the man she loved, if she has left and, I'm sure she's kind of processing that or true or and then to avoid her ex-husband, the father of her children, um, is really interesting the kind of dance that goes on there with, you know, them. Um, that um, boy, he's he's a piece of work. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I was interested in, you know, one one of them being rich and the other poor, uh, uh, one family having a lot of means and the other family or its various members, uh, very, you know, more or less fiscally challenged in, in different ways. And, and would they hate each other? Would there be tension? What, you know, um, what would happen? And, right. um, yeah. Do, and I thought it was really interesting how Lorna had, had this guilt about her grown children too, um, which kind of, you know, it makes, I mean, it's ex maybe exploring parental, what, do your parental duties ever end or, you know, slow down? <laughs> yeah, that was there. certainly in there. Yeah, that question. 
uh, which probably we all feel uh, as parents. Um, and your, your children, even though they're 60 or, you know, remain your children. So uh, that I found interesting to, to explore. Yeah, yeah, how would, should she have done something differently? And, and Lorna was also 20 years ago from 2008 was, you know, still when it wasn't that women were always out working, you know, it wasn't actually yeah. that long ago. And how I thought it was really interesting that Ran had some, um, anyway, he, he never seemed to appreciate that. Whereas with his current wife, his, you know, she's, she came, you yeah, know, a billionaire. Really, really, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that that was something that, that men, I suppose, have gone through too, that they've seen the role of women change and they have to get used to that. And, um, do you see that in France happening, the role of men? Do you yeah, think? I think so, actually. They, there's, you know, they're writing about it in, in magazines and stuff. Um, but there are quite a few now women executives and um, they get, written up and, and, and I think there's a lot of female power in, in France, maybe sort of newly, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And wow. maybe, yeah, um, a, a lot of it, some of it is kind of inherited, like the people who, the woman who inherited um, Lancome or Oreal, you know, I mean, there's there are these great cosmetic firms and. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Her mother. Yeah. L'Oreal is one of the richest women and her father. Yeah, yeah. The whole Nazi, you know, thing with that. And, and she took yeah. it over. Yeah, that's true. You know, but she seems to be like one of these uh, women that seems to stay out of the spotlight or I, maybe you live there. I don't know. But yeah, no, she does. Uh, yeah. I think that's really intriguing. You know, they're not. You know, and also that whole thing of um, Americans, we're bling bling, right? We show off, we, I mean, generally speaking. Whereas I think in France, you know, that saying to live well is to live hidden. You know, it's yes. not about- They're totally discreet. Bling would be just absolutely, uh, you know, disapproved or ostracized, I think. I'm, su yeah. I'm sure there's a blingy set, but they're not the ones that are running things. Exactly, it's about yeah discretion, and you don't show off, you know. So yeah. far into so far into us, <laughs> but, yeah. 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 Um, is there anything about this book when you were writing? I mean, how long is this a book you've worked on for a while, or was it something that, you know? Uh, well, because a lot of the, the territory was familiar, San Francisco family. Sure. Uh, it wasn't as hard to write as some other things that I. have I've written that maybe required more research and, and so on. So I enjoyed writing this more than I've enjoyed some, some of my books. Uh, it was oh, fun. It, yeah. it shows, it really shows, you know, I mean, it's really, and Lulu, I mean, not Lulu, I'm thinking Lulu and Marrakesh, no. Lorna spares no one, not even herself, you know, with this, you know, looking at herself, um, which I really, really admired, you know, she's like, doesn't pretend to be perfect, or at least in this voice. Um, do you think, um, and what do you think about there's, you know, us American expats who, who dream of live, going in the French countryside to a village and learning, you know, learning cooking or pastry, you know, I mean, that's so, yeah. uh, we just love to do that. So right? us, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where does that come from? You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Where does our American love for France come from? You know, I've tried to answer that question. Um, I mean, I've thought about it. And I guess we all have. You probably have, you have too. Um, it's, it's a real thing. Americans have a special affinity for France, but I'm not sure. I, does it come from Lafayette? Does it come from, you know, Benjamin Franklin? There's some deep thing. Deep and, you know, we just, you know, colored glasses, romantic and, and but yeah. still also the earthiness too. Um, yeah, but also uh, okay, a certain number of people come and go home disappointed, but usually not. Usually 
Americans feel that they've learned something or gained skills or whatever, that they come away better and happier from their, from their trip or their time in France. Um, so it's like a stage in our education or something. That's a great way, that's a great way to put it, yeah. And there's also this, this, I think Lorna ponders at one point, you know, about being with Armand Lou, L-O-U-P, that's Wolf, right? Yeah. Armand Lou. It's a name in France, I don't know why. <laughs> I thought yeah. he was a wolf anyway, but. Um, <laughs> and he was a wolf, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, you know, how, how he handles it, how he, you know, and how women notice him because of who he is, you know. Uh, but there's this thing of, of joy, you know, living with joy and, and, you know, love and great sex and all this. Um, and then, you know, but what about Americans? They're always thinking of, you know, well, like, gotta, you know, gotta work, you know, gotta, you know, take that pill to calm down or, you know, whatever, Xanax or, you know, whereas in France, it's not, you know, it's quite different, you know, and earth, I love the earthiness of people. And, um, but yeah, maybe that's part of it too, that it's all the, all the other, you know, exterior is stripped away and it's about good food good wine good food. yeah the right person yeah the, the, at least those are their values i um read the other day that the french take more xanax than any other europeans and i was really shocked by that wow i wow. know i should probably check that stat before I promulgate it. But <laughs> I was really surprised because everything, yeah. yeah, many sources of anxiety are are not threatening to them because they already know the rule and they don't have to feel their way through certain cultural obstacles that Americans usually do. And so I, I think that in itself should give them serenity and maybe it does. Totally, uh, so that's yeah. a really great way to put it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I've always been convinced it's the school. They start in the creche, you know, in the preschool. They do, you know, I, I have a, a, an example of this that when we were talking about, um, I don't know, food, uh, when my grandchildren, my daughter's children were about four and they went to preschool or kindergarten or whatever it was, um, the mothers all stood outside and the teachers brought the children out when it was time to collect them. And on the door of the school uh, was posted the menu for the day. And so the mothers would know what the children had eaten. And the menus were expressed um, as an entree, which is you know the first course in France, the main course and the dessert. And so each little top uh, was asked by his mother. They would be discussing it as they walked away. You know, a, uh, how were the creamed peas, dear? Or you know, did you like the Jello? <laughs> and, and, and so they begin discussing uh, food from you know as tiny tots. I'm sure they do that in the crash with the babies even. Yeah, so, yeah. And once I was talking with one of one of the the grandchildren, at the same age, and I said something like, "Oh, first we'll have." Or I wasn't describing a menu. I was just saying, "Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have some trout and some soup, some lentil soup and some chocolate cake?" And he said, "Soup before." the <laughs> the main course so bien sûr yeah. <laughs> yeah wow i rem i remember i brought my friend's daughter to the crash uh where she was living in paris because she, you know and i was very nervous because you know i thought i'd have to have uh, show my passport and you know yeah. these, which you should you know show identification and i quickly got everything together and took her in and and I was so impressed how the teacher took her. I mean, she was like oh, eight months old. Okay, it's much smaller and, and said, okay, and she had a whole checklist of, uh, did she sleep last night? Did she have a bowel movement this morning? <laughs> Has she uh -huh. had anything to eat? Or a whole intake, you know, and in, which I thought was marvelous, you know? To, yeah, that is marvelous. They, yeah, the whole crush thing is fabulous for women. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah. it starts so early, it yeah. inculcates them. <laughs> well, but, and, uh, and also it allows women to work with, uh, without anxiety and without changing, searching for help and bunches of different babysitters and, and all the problems of women who work. Uh, right. If you can get a place in the crash, which is another issue though, they're not enough. But for those who can get a place in the crash for their baby, they can be fully confident that the care is top notch and they can work. Top notch. Yeah. yeah, and picking them up and everything, you know, and even even yeah. if she was on medication, you know, they would take her, which is great. You know, yeah. if you have a child with a slight fever and you still have to go to work. So yeah. Yeah. It was, it was perfect. I want to see if there's any questions, Diane. So I'm gonna move my I'm supposed to do my job here and find out and put my okay, I don't see any open questions, so maybe I'm not looking in the right place, but I've got plenty more. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> or Jamie, do you have some? Am I yes. So oh, there are, no, 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 you're doing great. This is awesome. There's, um, it looks like there's one question from Karen right now. That's the only one um, asking to describe your writing process. But um, other than that, I'll minimize my video, keep submitting questions and they will be under the Q&A icon. Okay. <laughs> so what is your writing process, Diane? Um, Has it well, I think uh, probably like yours, I, I have a computer. Over the years, I depend on it more and more. But at the beginning, I was kind of snobbish about it and preferred to write in longhand and then type. Um, so uh, I can't say that I don't use the computer or anything. And I can't really say that I write in longhand, which is what I used to say. Um, and I write, try to write it in the morning, but that's not always possible. So I, then I just write when I can. And um, I don't know. It, 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 do, you have a, do you have a word count or a goal every day or page count? No, page? No, no. no, I don't I either. Yeah. I try to do a, I try to do a scene every, every day, whether it's a short, short scene, you know, it does, or, you know, which, the next day I may expand or not. I just try to go somewhere, you know. From now, that is that is good advice, I think, and I should do that. Um, I, I was struck by one of Hemingway's bits of advice, which is to stop in the middle of a sentence mm -hmm. so that you know what the rest of the sentence is going to say and, and that'll carry you into your work for the next day. It's but I don't, yeah, I don't have a real problem starting up in the morning or anything because I don't know, my life is so fragmented that I've learned to snatch bits of time and, and, and plunge right in. Sure. Yeah. I, when I first started writing and my son was in school and I would, uh, you know, write in a, I had a, you know, long hand on, in the carpool line, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Yes. You, you had to just take take every chance that you got. I used to take my children to Sunday school so that I could go down into the angel costume room and work you know, for an hour. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So a question asked, how, Diane, how do you like San Francisco these days? Well, it's changed, I have to say. Um, and I, there are certain things I no longer do, like take my car out because it's impossible to park anywhere. I, you know, I go on Uber. Uber, um, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's harder to get restaurant reservations because there are all these dot-com people uh, in the restaurants. They're absolutely jammed. Mm -hmm. And um, downtown is getting kind of grungy and I don't go downtown so much. But otherwise, I haven't found it. I, I, I don't interface with it. You know, I, I'm in my neighborhood, which is Russian Hill. I go to the restaurants on Russian Hill. I see my friends mm -hmm. by Uber, etc. cetera. So, so, yeah, that's very smart. Yeah. I yeah. will tell you, though, that, I mean, you know, of course, all the restaurants have been shut down, right? But they're yeah. opening. And so one of my favorites, the kind of longstanding Zuni, you know, down on market. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, favorite of mine too. It's open. Oh, oh good. It's open. 
Yeah, oh, so they're trying. Try and get a reservation for when you come in the summer. Start now. <laughs> Start now. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't ever easy, even when Judy Rogers was alive. Alas, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, can't wait I used to go back. Judy's cookbook a lot. Her, her, her recipe for the roast for roast chicken is the best. The best. The best. Totally. Okay. Let me see if there's more questions here. I have to. I have to. No. Okay. Good. Um. Can I ask a question about like in Paris, a writing community? Are you, are you in part of the community? I mean, are you, how does, you know, that work? I mean, as a long time citizen of Paris. So do you, is that important to you? Um, um, well, it's nice to have colleagues and I, I don't have too many. And of course we couldn't see each other uh, during the, the, this long confinement, which is only now just, you know, uh, opening mm -hmm. up. But I do see other writers, uh, um, and when you come, we used to have a writers group. It was it was thought of by Ward Just, the late Ward Just, and then it, it was carried on by Mavis Gallant, the late Mavis Gallant. So you know our 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 little number it was dwindling, but Jake Lamar, um, Jake Lamar, yeah, Jake and and me, and if if you come and when you come, you know, if and when we revive this. Uh, I, and I hope we do, then you will come. And oh, um, I'd love to. Amy love to. can comes when she comes to Paris, um, you know, anyone visiting. So we try to keep a little literary contact with the home, the mothership, America. I, I love Mavis Gallant. Uh, I went to uh, have hot chocolate with her once at the floor, not the floor, no, the other one. Um, the Mago. Anyway. De Mago. And it was, she was just so gracious, loved, loved her, loved her work. Um, and then she passed away. And um, who was um, the woman who had the wonderful bookstore on the left bank and the Blue Dissin, um, you know, the Odile bookstore. Odile Elie. Yeah. Odile Elie yeah. was putting yeah. together her notebooks or something or her. Um, papers or was I think she is. Yeah, I, think, I mean, she's reputed to be doing that. I run into her once in a while and say, how's it going? And she always says, oh, very well. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I will hope that someday Odile will, you know, yeah. Because, yeah, she had everyone, everyone, every American and Canadian writer uh, in her store to read and everyone did. Uh, and she, she can tell a few stories, I think. Wonderful, wonderful bookseller. Um, I yeah, mean, wonderful. I see this. Yeah. yeah, it was right in Saint Germain, like the street, but I, I mean, I walked by Good it. Process. I, thank you. Yeah. 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 Oh, she's, she's great. Um, and do you know um, the Red Wheelbarrow? Down, uh, I, you know, I should, it's just a little out of my walking path. And so I keep meaning to go and not kind of sign in now that we're open again. And I haven't done it yet, but I'm, I'm planning to. Oh, good. Yeah, she's great. She is, the, yeah, she's great. And it's the reigning now uh, English language bookstore. So, well, there's uh, also- um, Shakespeare, yeah. Yeah. Or W.H. Smith is still open, right? So, it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they only handle English books. And I don't uh -huh. know about Galignani, which is also, but for me on the left bank, those are, are you know, major outings to go, to go yes. over there. You know. Oh, nice. Okay, I think we have a question. I saw a question and it went away. So I don't know. Um, something about starting a scene uh, maybe, maybe Jamie can help me. Here. Yes, yes. So Karen <laughs> is wondering, do you start with a scene or have a complete outline? Bo both, in a way. Certain scenes, you know, come kind of full blown, like the graveyard scene. And are you still there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. okay. I think Jamie faded away for a minute. Oh, I see. So yeah, suddenly it was just a black screen. Um, so sometimes the scene comes, but sometimes uh, I try to make outlines. And I've outlined other people's books where I've admired the way the suspense 
happens or the way the characters are introduced. It's very interesting to outline book. Uh, yeah, other people's books. Other people's books in, in yeah, learn from that. Wow. Um, Emma once. That was very complicated. And um, what uh, Emma, I must have done others. The Good Soldier I did. And wow. um, just for my own amusement really, but for my own writing then I tried to make snippets of outline if I can, because so that I'll know in what order those scenes will have the best effect. If you can do it schematically, you can see certain things that um, if you just plunge in and it's all words, don't necessarily come to you. You must Are have you to ever that with detective fiction. Yeah, are you ever influenced by film or, you know, black and white film or, you know, for visuals? I've, I've always no, been very- No, not, not really, not for visuals. The way I was influenced by film, when I worked for Stanley Kubrick, he was very big on the outline. And, oh. I, learned, and I learned to do, you know, an outline of scenes from working with Kubrick. Wow, so, that would be fascinating. I, I, yeah, and then since since then I've I've applied that to my novels, and I think to their benefit. Yeah, I, I wish I could outline, but that makes total sense. Yeah, well, yeah you know, yeah. you have to discipline yourself to do it because it's tempting to want to plunge right in, and write, you know, make people say things and so on. But um, if you just make yourself do the outline, I find it very profitable. Okay, I'm going to try that, Diane. I'm going to make my. I'm trying to. I'm working on a short story, and I'm plunging right in. But I'm like, ooh, it's like scraping my fingernail. <laughs> oh well, I, I, I can need... tell you Alice Adams's formula for the short story. She well, said, yeah. "Oh yeah, I write all my stories this way." She learned it at Radcliffe. She said, "And it goes A, B, D, C, E, action, background." Wait, action, action, uh-huh. Action, background. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that can't be D, right. A, B, D, no. A, B, A, B, D, C, E, E being end. But I think I've mixed up the, the C and the D. Anyway, it's climax, uh, yeah, D, denouement or development. Development, mm -hmm. climax, ending. And, and she claimed that that works for any short story. So apply it to your short story and see. I will, action, back, okay, sorry. I just <laughs> I want I to put all these up I here. Know. Can it be so um, easy? Action, background, development, mm -hmm. climax, ending. Cool, okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I hope all you short story writers got that down. <laughs> but yeah. um, that's great, that's great to know. <laughs> See if there's more questions. Um, do you write? Do you write the art of each scene? Is that how Kubrick does it? Arc. I'm sorry. Arc. Put my glasses on. Do you? Did you? Do you write the arc of each scene? Is that how Kubrick did it? Yes. Uh, in okay. in the case of Kubrick, in the case of The Shining, which is a film that I worked on with Kubrick, um, each each scene had a, a page. And then the page would have notes and a sort of description of the arc. Mm. It goes short. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's it's beginning, middle, end. It starts somewhere, it goes somewhere else. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. And there was another one here. Was the process of writing this book different from your, your previous works? Did the book turn out how you expected, or did it take a direct a different direction? Um, I, the process was the same in that I've, I always find that it's hard once I get into it, each book has its own set of problems. So, so they're, they're not like each other, but they're like each other in posing problems. And, um, and then uh, what was the, re the end, end of the question? Uh, I'm so bad. I can't. Um, uh, 
I'm sorry. I that was my it. fault. I went ahead and uh, got rid of it. The last part is, did the book come out how you expected or did it take a different direction? Oh, okay. Should have um, remembered that. It, it, well, it turned out uh, differently, I think, because as in the process of writing, I got fonder of some characters that I hadn't really expected to play a big role, uh, you know, um, there's a character called Gilda, she's 15, and I didn't really, I, I hadn't been planning to do much with her, but I got interested in her. She turned out to be an interesting girl. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you know, that's an example. You just have to go with whatever this weird interaction is between yourself and your unconscious and what you're putting on the paper. And very pivotal character she turned out to be, actually. Yeah, in, yeah. In many ways, than who would have thought? Um, would, yeah. It, but that was great. I thought also Ren, or maybe I mentioned Ren and and Armand Lou. Um, I thought they had a, a character arcs, uh, which I was happily surprised with. I won't say what that was, but I felt they really went somewhere on this journey. They changed, you know. They. Yeah, I think I, I hope all the characters changed. Mm -hmm. Some, yeah. yeah. Okay, here's another question. Um, are you surprised by the success of this book? Happily surprised, maybe? Happily surprised, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Happily surprised. Do you, yeah. um, so, I mean, um, I guess that the, I mean, were you, how long did this take you? Did you answer that yet? You know, did it take a year, several years? Is it? It took, you know, there's a part where you think about it, and I don't know if you count that part. So it took a couple sure. of years to write, and then mm -hmm. maybe longer to think about it. Sure. But your book is everywhere, you know, as it should be, especially at Copperfield, um, your old stamping ground, so to say. Yeah, and, um, that's absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so um, no, I'm delighted and uh, you know, very it's very gratifying because that doesn't always happen. I was very fond of Lulu and Marrakesh, for example. And you know, people, I don't know, that didn't particularly endear itself to other people. I don't know why. Maybe it was because it was in Morocco or you know, the exotic background. I don't know. But anyway. This yeah. has been so fantastic listening to you both. Thank you so much. There have been so many questions coming to me asking about whether it's being recorded and you're in luck. Yes, it is. You, everyone will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, details for purchasing both Diane's title and previous works by Kara, as well as Diane, and we'll also include the discount code. Um, yeah, basically, I hope you did nothing but watch and enjoy today because tomorrow you'll receive everything else. And I want to thank you both. Thank you, Diane. You're in Paris. And thank you, Kara. You're in Denver. You're both out of Denver. Denver. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, thank you. Oh, thank you. We can see how dark it's become in Paris, Diane. And yeah, thank you for right. bearing with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I <laughs> no, love the book. And right. everyone yeah. else, you will love this book. Okay, you really will. It's just really funny and touches your heart as well. You know. So, and Diana, yeah. à, à la prochaine. Okay. À la prochaine. <laughs>